Greetings, old friends. Today, I just review this intimidating piece of equipment. The Twin Peak Kitani Gray Sword by LK Chan. So this sword has a very broad blade, 30 inch long blade, including the barrel, both are here. And the grip is 20 inches long, including the pummel. Overall, it's 50 inch long. As you can see, the proportion makes it a very versatile weapon. It was used by a nomadic horde called the Kitans that plagued northern China from the 10th to the 12th century until their eventual destruction at the hands of another nomadic tribe called the Jerkins. This style of sword was issued to the hempic elite companion troops of the Kitani emperors. And there was some dispute of whether it was used from horseback or in foot combat, which we'll talk about later. But undoubtedly it was used exclusively by heavy armored troops as great coverage from head to toe in heavy steel Lebanon armor. The sword overall weighs 5-2 pounds, which makes it a rather heavy sword for its size. So very likely it was used by uh, troops protected by armor pretty much impervious to regular sword slashes. Uh, they can have a close war combat using this sword to dish out devastating cuts and perhaps thrust as well. Most likely, according to my speculation, in foot combat. And many of these swords were discovered all over northern China as a pair of equipment along with a long single-handed saber. This configuration can pretty much lend credits to the speculation that it was used as a primary weapon and it was backed up by a sidearm used in single hand. First, let's look at its performance in cutting. Take a look. Funky, maybe. Two inches. The thickness of the tree is about the same as the blaze width. Bye. 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 Bye.
they were used in different circumstances. And L.K. Chen speculated that this sword could be used from horseback, probably from the reliance of the Kitani people on the cavalry forces, but I beg to differ, because this sword is exceedingly heavy for its size. And you can see here is uh, just above my belly button, not very long at all, especially the blade, it's only 30 inch in length. That's the average blade length for single-handed saber throughout Asia. I just don't think there's enough length for this sword to be used from horseback because you want some extra reach from the horseback to reach the infantries, also other horsemen. And I just don't think you can swing this sword in one hand and reach that far uh, because of its weight. Of course, you can gain greater reach by holding down on the handle, and in that case, you'll probably have maybe 35, 32, 37 inch uh, in reach, but it's just so heavy. And I don't think you need this mass, especially when you swing it from the horseback, being carried by the horse, the mass of the horse and the rider, uh, the speed of the horse galloping. I just don't think you, you need this amount of mass sacrificing the durability. Of course, many cavalry swords used throughout the ages, like the Spasa by the Romans, uh, the cavalry swords uh, used by the Han Dynasty Chinese, also Type 11 army swords, all have very long blade. Uh, usually reach 35 to 38 inches, just the blades themselves. And of course, that makes sense, and it, it can be a little for heavy because you're not gonna really fence sword play a lot with someone and you just kind of ride by and uh, deliver a very devastating cut uh, with greater reach and the speed of the horse and the mass of the rider and the horse will take care of that uh, making the blow very devastating so the long handle on this sword uh, makes me think that it's probably used on foot by these riders because uh, they prefer melee combat over horse archery uh, unlike uh, the Hans or other nomadic people of the steppes uh, that also means that they could be very well trained in the art of foot combat so having a sword this versatile you can switch different grips favoring reach and power or maneuverability. Uh, if you can look at the point of balance, it's only one and a quarter inch from the guard, this very large guard. So using this grip, you can have very quick uh, for fencing on foot combat, and the lack of reach is mostly compensated by the presence of heavy armor because you can take uh, blows from lesser swords, you know, lightweight swords, regular swords, and this is almost like a pole arm, like a glaive. And many of these were found with broken tan because it has a hidden tan that's rather thin comparing to the broad blade. Some are found with this large plate pommel, others are found with a uh, steel cap found on many uh, Chinese and Korean and Mongolian style swords, but also green pommel swords are uh, usually found on Chinese swords. And uh, the modern makers reproducing this historical source prefer this very unique plated pommel, but many finds were in a condition with broken tan, and you just don't know how long the tan can go. So perhaps some of those blades were mounted on a longer pole, which makes them just a glaive. And during the Song Dynasty, glaives, which are long blades mounted on a long pole, uh, were exceedingly popular. Many types of blades were recorded in military treatises, and some of those have similar styles with one or two clip points on the back. So it could be 
very possible that the Kitani people also use the style of、uh, glaive with longer pole, but some were made with shorter grips、uh, in sword style. Probably some warriors preferred this、uh, close quarter combat because you can't really use、uh, glaives in confined spaces. So maybe palatial guards, people who expect actions in indoor spaces, will prefer this style of sword, the grip. And having lesser reach,、uh, when you have heavy protection all over your body, it is a lesser concern. Just like the blade from the Song Dynasty, and later have a very broad blade, broader than most Chinese swords at the base already, and it tapers upward. So at the, the quick points, they become very wide, very broad. So this means from the spine to the edge, you can have a longer bevel. So if you look at the bevel, edge bevel on this blade. It's a continuous combat grind, but it's not full combat grind. Meaning that the blade doesn't get thinner starting from the spine. There is about a third of the width below the spine that has a consistent thickness, and then from there, about here, it tapers down to have a convex edge, very durable. But the edge is very well apexed. It can have a very good performance in cutting. There's no visible shoulder and,、uh, on the blade. You cannot feel any. So as it passes through the target, it'll be a very smooth cut. But also, this ensures some thickness and rigidity and mass on the blade. So, which makes it a very superior cutter. If you flex the blade, there's very little flex. Of course, that partially comes from the lens. Blade is not very long, so it's always gonna flex less than other swords. But also the thickness. It's not very thick at the base.、Uh, it's about 6.4 millimeters, just above this、uh, bolster, if you will. It has this、uh, very unique Eastern Asia style bolster, unlike the habaki font on Japanese swords. It has an elongated part at the base of the edge. So when you parry a blow,、uh, when you catch the blade on this part,、uh, it's very durable. It's likely to damage the blade. Just above this、uh, bolster is 6.4 millimeters, and it tapers in a more or less linear fashion to 3 millimeters near the tip. So it's still very lively, especially with such a long grip. It's very maneuverable.、Um, of course, it can get in the way sometimes. If you change grip, you want to do a cut like this, like a cross arm. It's a little bit strange, but you can always switch grip. Like this. Also, you can choke down to gain power. You can have a longer lever, so you can have a better rotational speed. This would be very devastating on horses. Whether armor or not, or personnel in all sorts of、uh, protection, the, the amount of mass it has cutting down is unlike regular single-handed swords used in this time by the Han, as the Chinese, but also other nomadic tribal people. So against someone in heavy Lebanon armor, which It's pretty much impervious to sword slashes,、uh, regular swords anyway. This amount of mass will still deal a lot of percussive maintenance for them because the laminar armor they are constructed with smaller plates, unlike the full plate harness from the late medieval and Renaissance Europe. It doesn't offer that amount of rigidity to resist a very heavy blow from the sword. Another reason I'm not convinced that this is a cavalry sword is that it has this large pommel and the long grip. So wherever you hold it,、uh, it can come into interference、uh, as you chop into the target. You ride by, and this can actually bump into the horse if it got、uh, 
bumps this way, or it can just uh, collide with your own arm, the user's own arm. So uh, it just doesn't seem very intuitive as a cavalry sword. Of course, you can let go of the rein temporarily and hold the sword in two hands, but then you don't really gain any reach. You actually sacrifice some reach. You can't really lean forward and deliver a, a slash. So it just doesn't seem to be the case. Also, their companion single-handed saber seem to be long enough, usually have longer blades than these, and they're exclusively for single-handed usage which leads me to believe that they were used as cavalry swords um, in one hand, or in the other hand, hold on to the rein. This curvature on the upper portion of the blade uh, is very unique to this period. We know that earlier Chinese single-edged Dao all have straight blades and throughout, there's no curvature at all, for a very long time, for about a solid years, Chinese single-edged swords just have this uh, very slender straight blade, very simple. Sometimes has a slight forward curve uh, for increased cutting power. And during Song Dynasty, many of the swords, especially single-edged ones, uh, became curved gradually, and that's probably due to the nomadic influence. Because when you think of it. Cavalry swords can benefit quite a bit from having a curvature. When you ride through a target and you cut into it, it's unlikely it will get stuck in the target as you draw it out. The curvature will help it. Uh, if you lose your sword or have it stuck, trying to retrieve it when you are horseback can injure your hand or arm. That's never a good thing, and you can lose your sword. Also, having a curvature here can assist in a slicing motion, so this makes it a uh, superior cutter. Also, in on a horseback, if you give a point like this, you can slice into someone without having to swing it, uh, which is a little bit hard to do from the horseback. So let's talk about the build quality of the sword. Like I said, the blade is ground very well, singular bevel, even though it's not a full convex spine, the edge is very refined. There's no secondary bevel. It's very sharp, very well apexed. It also has a very consistent polish on the sword. The bolster is made of steel, has a silvery sheen. I'm not sure whether I prefer this or blackened iron, but these uh, guard and the, the pommel are made of solid iron and heat glued. So there's no worry of corrosion. They're very big comparing to other period swords. Some Tsuba style disc guards are already found on swords and bars in this period. But they are not as big. You can see the this style of guards are usually referred to as a papaya style, papaya shape. It has a good coverage. Front and back, also lateral protection. So it's a little bit like the rundown on some medieval pole axis. This pommel, big plated pommel, is very unusual on Asian swords. Uh, usually they're very refined, hollow, uh, perforated. Sometimes there's no pommel at all, just a metal cap at the end of the grip. Sometimes ring pommel on Chinese swords. But they don't offer a lot of mass, counterweight. This is definitely very heavyweight. It's definitely there to not only provide retention if you choke it all the way down for your hands, but also some substantial amount of mass as counterweight to balance out the blade. Overall, it's quite maneuverable, but also quite stout. It has a durable yet intimidating feeling to it. The blade itself is pretty well made, but some of the fittings are not fitted perfectly. If you look at the bolster here, where it meets the blade, you can see there is a gap, and that's never a good thing. I prefer to envelop the blade, place up the blade entirely. And also where this bolster meets 
uh, this card, there's a little bit of gap here where you can stick a fingernail in there. Not a good sign. And get water in there and it's impossible to clean or cause some corrosion. Also, where it meets the blade, it's very well jacketed. There's no gap in here. So, well done. Uh, this card, uh, just a plain flat plate. There's no paper at all. And the edges are very rough. They have burrs and they're not polished in any way. I've seen some antiques of a titanium gray sword having a pommel and a guard in a rough shape as well. But those were estimated from burials, so they're in poor shape uh, with a lot of corrosion and whatnot. So we don't know whether they have burrs. Uh, it's hard to believe that they're made for elite troops companions to the emperor. By the way, these are uh, issued, they're commissioned by the uh, royal army and issued to the troops, not individually made. They all have similar, if not identical, fittings on the originals. I suspect the original have some rims uh, rounded on the edges and the corners of these fittings, so they wouldn't be a nuisance when you handle them, especially this pommel here. It's just the burrs, it's crazy. When you cut with it, if you rotate here, it will totally, will totally collide and scratch the forearm. Of course, if you are uh, clad in heavy armor and clothing, that wouldn't be a problem, but I still prefer these edges, chamfered or at least rounded, polished. Uh, so, first of all, they don't look that crude, and in handling, it wouldn't cause any injury and discomfort. The grip is like the usual budget Chinese sword reproduction, have a rosewood handle, two slabs of rosewood glued together. They're a little rough, and um, I don't really mind it. I have several swords uh, of the style of grips. They're relatively comfortable. Uh, sometimes it can get a little slippery, so some leather wrapping would be nice. The purse of uh, the grip, it has a slight taper. It's thinner here uh, and gets thicker, or not really thicker, but uh, definitely the circumference gets a little bit bigger there. The circumference is a little bit too much for me. Uh, I prefer not thin grips, but uh, just right for my hand. Um, it's also a little bit rounded. It's oval, of course, and it's nowhere being cylindrical, so you can still get a feel of the edge alignment just not as well as some other LK Chan swords. But overall, I think the build quality of this sword for its price range of $450 can be improved further. But as it is now, it's a good reproduction of a fascinating historical piece uh, that recently called the imagination of the Chinese sword reproduction scene. Many makers are now offering Reproduction of similar quality of the Twin Peak style Kitani Gray Sword. And along with some other Jamado, the horse cleaving saber style swords uh, from the Tang and Sun Dynasty. The part I prefer the least is this sheath. Unlike other swords made by LK Chen, which usually offer very high quality wood core scabbard, sometimes with Red skin wrap, others with leather wrapping or a lacquered wood with uh, decorations. This one features just a sheath, very, very floppy, of uh, stack leather style, uh, which I prefer the least. I absolutely hate it. It has this feel of cheap, more ninja, tactical vibe, and the leather is of very poor quality. When you store the blade inside of this, after a while, it gathers some corrosion, some rust spot on the blade. So it's definitely a poor choice to house this uh, intimidating blade here. I get that the unique blade shape, that having a straight spine to this clip point and then having a curvature uh, makes it pretty hard uh, to have a scabbard. But 
at least make something that works. This doesn't even work well as a shipping container. Do I prefer not having scabbers at all? I don't know, even in this case, when it's so poorly made. By the way, this is not seen on any previous models for LK10. If you look at this, well, this could work as a shipping container at least. And until you turn the blade upside down, it just, if you don't notice this, you can very well grab the blade and cut your hand. And that's not good at all. So there's no effort, not even like any leather strap to go around the grip to secure this. This is definitely a poor choice. And I really, I'm really not a fan of this stack leather style sheets on some recent LK Chen models, the Jamadal, the Military Dado, and the um, Twin Peak Titanic Resort. Um, if you want to provide leather sheets, that's uh, probably okay. At least have them tailor made to the models, have quality leather to work with. Definitely not this. Overall, do I recommend this model? It's definitely a very unique historical sword that had been rarely reproduced up to this point. With so many options on the reproduction market, especially from China, offering this style of sword recently, uh, I think LK Chen can do a little bit better. Whether that will increase the cost of the reproduction is unknown. So far, the base model, I like it a lot. I like uh, the shape, the heft, everything about it. I just wish that it could be it could be fitted with the usual standard coming from LK Chen swords. I have four swords by LK Chen, Chinese swords from the classical period. They have excellent fit and finish on top of having superior heat treatment, very good edge geometry, excellent handling. This one does just that in most departments, but the fit and finish can be improved a little bit more. There's another sword coming from LK Chen, a European style Balinese arming sword, uh, signifies LK Chen's enterprise into the European sword production market. Very exciting. I'm very grateful having this review sample here sent by LK Chen. And I hope they work with experts on their future models. Historical accuracy and authenticity is great as usual. I just hope that they can keep the quality control level high, just as their earlier endeavor. Thank you for watching, and if you find some value or entertainment, please like and subscribe.